Good afternoon or good evening, as the case might be, to all of our alumni and friends joining us today. My name is Devang Desai, and on behalf of the University of Miami Alumni Association, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Distinguished Alumni Lecture Series featuring today's topic, the future of the United States Supreme Court. As a University of Miami double alumnus, a member of the Board of Trustees and President-elect of our Alumni Association, I am very honored to host this event tonight. As many of you know, the Distinguished Alumni Endowed Lecture Series recognizes and celebrates University of Miami alumni who have distinguished themselves and our alma mater through their achievements, and professional accomplishments. It also serves to foster intellectual dialogue among the University of Miami community and encourage the lifelong pursuit of learning, which is part of our university's mission. This prestigious event was established in 1995 through the generous support of Stu Block, a 1964 graduate, and Ambassador Julia Chang Block. We are especially honored that they are joining us today as we celebrate the 26th anniversary of this wonderful lecture series. You will hear from Stu and Julia much later in the program when we recognize the accomplishments of our distinguished alumni panel during the awards presentation. And so on to the business at hand. The topic of discussion for today is the future of the Supreme Court, which stems from Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation to our high court, which as many of you will agree, was certainly a contentious one, passing with a 52 to 48 vote in the US Senate. Supreme Court justices typically serve for life and have significant power in interpreting laws that can affect society at large and thus this appointment of a justice is one that could have important ramifications for the future of Supreme Court decisions. The Supreme Court plays an essential role in ensuring that each branch of our government recognizes the limits of their own power. As the highest court in the land, it serves to ensure that the American people have the promise of equal justice under the law, and thereby the court also functions as a guardian and interpreter of the US Constitution. The debate on how to interpret our Constitution is ever ongoing. And to lead us in a panel discussion about the issues that are at stake in our high court, please join me in welcoming Tony Verona, Dean of the University of Miami School of Law. Dean Verona is the law school's 12th dean and the M. Manette Massey Professor of Law. Previously, he was Professor of Law, former Vice Dean, and Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs at American University, Washington College of Law. Since joining the University of Miami in early 2019, Dean Verona has risen to the challenge at hand. His leadership, consensus building and work ethic during these unprecedented times have been exemplary. He is committed to ensuring that our students continue to receive an elite education and only one that Miami law can provide. And with his leadership and the, that of his faculty, they both continue to stand out as leaders in our community, as well as in our legal professions and allowing for our students to succeed at no, no matter what the cost. And so clearly the future of our law school and that of a Miami law degree is that much brighter with the leadership and the steady hands of Dean Tony Verona. And so please join me in welcoming our law school's Dean, Dean Verona. Thank you so much, Devang, for that great introduction and good evening, everyone. Thank you too to Stu and Julia for providing us with this platform 
to examine the very important role the Supreme Court plays in our legal system and how that role may unfold and evolve in the months and years to come. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening to moderate this discussion on such a timely topic. As lawyers, legal educators, and citizens, uh, we know that the Supreme Court and its future impact us uh, greatly. And, and so we should be vigilant and know um, what it is that might be in store. The Supreme Court has addressed and will continue to address many important questions with sig significance not only for our democracy and our republic, but also commerce and industry, our relations with foreign nations, between states and amongst each other. It has ruled on personhood itself and the rights and liberties that flow from that personhood, whether actual or merely legal. The Supreme Court has ruled on many aspects of our everyday lives, from whether and how we are born to whom we can regard as legal family members, how we lead our lives as adults, whether and to what extent we are punished when we do wrong, how we die, when we die, and then even in what ways we may leave a legacy after we cease to exist. The court's prior rulings have touched on health care, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, the right to bear arms, voting rights, capital punishment, immigration, LGBTQ rights, federalism, and that's just to name a very few just from the last few years. Tonight, we will examine the important role the Supreme Court plays in our system of government and the ways in which its current makeup and the political substrate in which it finds itself might determine its future. I have the honor of introducing our distinguished alumni speakers, all of whom I'm proud to say are graduates, distinguished graduates of the University of Miami School of Law. Uh, they will share with us this evening their thoughts and wisdom on this topic. So we have a full program and I will be very brief with the introductions. To learn more about our distinguished alumni speakers this evening and their many, many accomplishments, please refer to our event website. Professor Henry Butler earned his JD from the University of Miami School of Law in 1982 and is Professor of Law and Executive Director of the Law and Economic Center at George Mason University's Antolin Scalia Law School. Deborah Enix Ross is a double cane who earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Miami in 1978 and her JD from the University of Miami School of Law in 1981. She is senior advisor to the International Dispute Resolution Group at Debevoise and Plimpton. Deborah has deep ties to the American Bar Association and is currently a strong candidate for president-elect of the American Bar Association, which is a diplomatic way of saying that Deborah is going to be the next president of the ABA, and we're extremely proud of that fact. Uh, Raquel Rocky Rodriguez is a double cane who earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Miami in 1982 and her JD from the University of Miami School of Law in 1985. She's a shareholder at Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney and serves as the, as the uh, as chair of the firm's Florida offices. Neil Sonnet is a double cane who graduated with his Bachelor of Arts in 1964 and his JD from Miami Law in 1967. He's the founder and managing partner of Neil R. Sonnet, PA. So please join me, everybody, in welcoming our distinguished dream panel of speakers for this particular topic. We have a lot to discuss, so let's jump right in. So Deborah Enix Ross, what does the current makeup of the court, of the new court, let's call it, mean for its future? Thank you, Dean Verona. Uh, so thrilled to be here with my fellow alums, and I'll jump right into that question. Um, so first, let's let's remember, let's recall the composition of the court. There are six conservatives, 
and three liberals. Generally speaking, that's how they are categorized. Justice Clarence Thomas is the longest serving justice with 30 years as of October of this year. Justice Stephen Breyer is the second longest serving justice, but at age 82, he's the oldest member of the court. And the three justices appointed by President Trump, that's Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Coney Barrett, are also the three youngest members of the court. And Justice Coney Barrett is the youngest of all of them at age 49. When we think about the court, uh, we tend to think about judicial activism versus judicial restraint. And by judicial activism, generally it's meant that those are justices that believe that there is a role for the courts in matters related to individual liberties. And those who follow more the judicial restraint give deference to policymaking prerogatives of the legislative and executive branch. So having thought about who's currently sitting there, I think that there are three areas where we are likely to see change. The first is, I think the court is likely to accept a broader range of what might be considered controversial cases. And why is that? Well, it takes four votes to accept a case. And in the past, the justices may have wanted to accept a case, but they knew if there was a 4-4 split with Justice Roberts serving as a swing vote, uh, even if a case were to be accepted, there may not have been sufficient votes uh, to go in one way, because as we all know, it takes five out of the nine votes. But now there's a six, a solid six block uh, 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 for the conservatives. So you're more likely to accept uh, those kinds of cases. Secondly, I think the interpretation of constitutional rights may shift. And by that, I mean the activist judges tended to use privacy language to uphold voting or healthcare or LGBTQ or other rights, which justices who favor judicial restraint may want to restrict. And the third area I think is outside of the Supreme Court, actually. I think we might begin to see an increase in interest and importance at the local level, local legislation and local elections, because there may be a turn towards uh, having states and local authorities protect and uphold some of the privacy rights that may begin to be restricted under the Supreme Court. So it'll be interesting to see you on board, but at other levels. Great answer, Deborah. So um, Henry, Neil, Great Rocky, answer, what Deborah. what do you all um, think? Henry, um, Neil, Rocky, what? It, uh, I'm, I'm getting a bit of an, of an echo, so yeah, good. all right, good. Um, uh, so uh, Deborah has it exactly right, I think, in terms of the ideological shift, right? We had been at equipoise, so four, four with Kennedy in the middle as the as the swing. And it seems like a lot of very smart observers are are now saying that we are really more at a six, three split in favor of the cons conservatives. Henry, Neil, Rocky, do you agree with that reading? Do you do you think that we are actually still at an equipoise or do you have a, a different view? Uh, this Henry, I'll um... I think I generally agree with that um, uh, characterization, but um, we're still so early in the new t in the with the new makeup of the court. Um, Amy Coney Barron has hardly been there, what three months, and uh, there are a lot of the people who carefully watch the court and try to say, "Well, is Kavanaugh going to be the new Kennedy?" or are debating with each other about this. Uh, type of stuff to see if there is a swing vote there as opposed to it always being 6-3 or 5-4. And uh, our coalition is going to be built in, in different and per, perhaps uh, surprising ways over time. So I, it's so early right now. I'm not a kind of 
one of the people who's a court watcher, but I, there's a, there's not a lot of agreement out there. I'd be interested to see what Neil has to say. Neil? Well, I think uh, that Deborah has it correct. Am I off mute? Yeah. Uh, you hear, hear me? Yeah. Uh-huh. I think, I think Deborah has it correct. There isn't any question about the fact that this is basically a 6-3 court now. Uh, whether or not that holds for all of the controversial decisions that may be accepted by the court, we'll have to wait and see because uh, Justice Barrett obviously is, is new and doesn't have a track record yet. But I think it's fair to say that given the events of the last four years, we have a very conservative Supreme Court. And that's one of the things that I'll talk about a little bit later uh, that has, uh, uh, has created some support for court reform. Uh, and we'll have to see what kind of form mm. that takes. Uh, absolutely. Rocky, so do you agree that we're at 6-3 now with the Supreme Court? Well, we're 6-3 in terms of uh, appointing presidents, but I, I disagree a little bit. I, I think Deborah is generally correct. But for example, uh, Justice Barrett already staked out a position in favor of religious liberty in a recent decision where she voted with the liberals uh, supporting the right of an inmate to have their minister with them uh, when the death penalty was going to be administered. Uh, something on which justices uh, Thomas and Alito dissented. It wasn't clear where Justice uh, Gorsuch, Gorsuch was on it, but Justice Barrett voted with the liberals on that one. So um, I think that we have to look at it on a, on a case by case basis. And I think to underline what Deborah said, it could be very good news for the Biden administration, ironically, because of the deference that a, a traditional uh, conservative uh, who advocates judicial restraint will take with regard to executive and legislative authority. So maybe in, the, in some areas where you know, people are arguing penumbras, um, to, imp to imply uh, privacy rights or other rights that are not expressly set forth in the Constitution that may be correct. But I think that uh, in the mold of Justice Scalia, who voted that flag burning was the First Amendment uh, expression, even though uh, personally he opposed it, I, I think that if you have people that are faithful to the letter of the Constitution, uh, the people who are supportive of upholding the Bill of Rights may be pleasantly surprised. From your lips. Good. So, so Rocky, while we're still with you, why don't I ask you the question, what does the change in administration mean to the short and long-term future of the Supreme Court? Well, in, in the short term, uh, as Deborah pointed out, um, the, the appointees of, of, governor, of uh, President Trump are all fairly young. And we, the two most senior justices, one is Justice Thomas, and of course, um, we have Justice Breyer. Uh, barring uh, a death or a, a resignation, there, there's not much that Justice um, Biden is going to be able to do unless uh, there's a move uh, that's successful to somehow increase uh, the membership of the court. Um, however, there are things that he can do in order to be ready. For example, um, his White House counsel's office probably already has a list of about five or 10 potential nominees to the Supreme Court should an opening come up. He has stated that he wants to uh, appoint an African-American female so I think the first short-term impact, uh, assuming that there's a vacancy before the end of his term, is that we will have the first African-American woman uh, on, on the court. Um, longer term, we have uh, about uh, almost 60 vacancies currently in the federal courts, four at the courts of appeal from where a lot of justices are recruited and the rest from the district courts. Uh, President Trump left about 40 uh, vacancies open. In addition, there's about a third 
of judges in, in the, throughout the federal judiciary who are eligible to take senior status. And you can anticipate that uh, a number of them who may lean more democratic and want President Biden to appoint their successor would use this as an opportunity to go senior. So I think in the longer term, what we're gonna see is, is the bench being prepared and a number of people that, uh, that the President Biden would like to see on the Supreme Court getting some plum appointments. We're gonna see more diversity in the types of candidates who are being appointed, um, more minorities, more women, more LGBTQ, um, and also perhaps uh, in, the, in the mold of Justice Barrett, less emphasis on Ivy League, less emphasis on big law firm credentials. I wholeheartedly agree, Rocky. Uh, Deborah, think... Henry, Neil, uh, uh, would, would you like to jump in? What does the change in White House party control mean to the Supreme Court short and long term? Well, I, I, what, one of the things that Rocky uh, mentioned, I think is really important. There are probably dozens uh, of district and appellate court judges uh, who are eligible to take senior status. And many of them have not taken senior status during the last administration and may well do that now. So I think President Biden is gonna have some extra appointments to make. Uh, and of course that's the feeder courts to the United States Supreme Court. So I think we need to keep an eye on that uh, and see what kind of makeup we have in the lower courts because those courts uh, make the, uh, the, the bulk of the decisions that affect our everyday lives. Uh, and many of the decisions that they make will not ever reach the Supreme Court, but will have an impact uh, on citizens across the country. Mm. Deal, Deal, I think I think you're really uh, focusing on something. The the bench is very important, and the circuit court judgeships. There are very few openings now. There expect to be a few more, but there are several circuits that have grown dramatically in terms of population. That really are there are not enough circuit court judges there, and I'm not talking about vacancies. I'm talking about slots, number of seats that are in those circuit courts. And if I were advising the Biden administration, I'd be working on trying to expand uh, the number of circuit court positions that he could fill in, in those areas. And that's perfectly consistent with, uh, with legislation to move forward with doing that. Mm -hmm. Deborah? Deborah? And, and just to, to round out the quartet, uh, I, I, or quintet, I, I absolutely uh, uh, agree that um, this is going to be an area of focus and importance. The, the diversity of the bench, the, the importance of that cannot be understated. Uh, it, it, it is really uh, tremendously important. And I, and I think the Biden administration has clearly indicated that it's important to them uh, and, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, I think that will have, in mm -hmm. some ways, as as much of an impact as De if De he were Deborah, do you do you, do you think he will, uh, do you think he'll focus on uh, younger judges in the same way that the Trump administration did? I think that it's uh, that that will be a part of diversity, uh, but um, and you look, you know, when you look at the justices that that Trump, that President Trump appointed to the Supreme Court, that clearly uh, really was important because as I said, you know, Judge Justice Coney Barrett is only 49 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if you look at 49 versus 82 for Justice Breyer, there, there's, a, there's a long arc there. So I think younger judges, I think diversity in all of its definitions uh, is going to be important and critical. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, one of the things that Rocky said that stayed with me a few minutes ago is that when we are, are looking at partisan or ideological balance to the Supreme Court, it is easy to fall into the trap of looking only at the partisan affiliation of the appointing uh, president, right, of the nominating president. 
That does not tell the whole story. I mean, if you if you look at Justice Kennedy, how he became the swing justice. Frankly, in I mean, if you if you take any one of several issues and look at how he voted, and not only how he voted, but whether he wrote the majority opinion in the in the gay rights cases, much of the progress in the LGBTQ movement over the last 20, 30 years has been attributable to Justice Kennedy, who was a Reagan appointee, right? He wrote the majority opinions in Romer, Lawrence, Windsor, Obergefell. So this goes back to Rocky's point that we, when we, when we think about these things about partisan affiliation and whether they're conservative or or liberal, those those labels have limited value, and nuance is in order. So, um, Henry, let's go to you. What are the chances that there will be a change in the membership of the court by means of court packing? over the next few years. There was all of this talk before the November election around the the court packing threat of the Senate Democrats, and and then there was a silence. Nobody was talking about it. So is it going to come back as an issue that is a live issue? Uh, I'll get to that in a second, but just to to follow up on your previous comment about surprising bedfellows on some of the majority uh, uh, that come up. There, although these are uh, the three most recent appointees are strong social conservatives, they also have very strong libertarian uh, leanings. And I think that will, will surprise people a lot, especially in a lot of the criminal uh, justice uh, type of cases. And so that, there are going to be a lot of surprises going forward with that. Um, I can't help but tell a, a story that I heard from candidate Trump asked about uh, what type of judges he, he was going to report uh, a point. And the response was along the lines and said, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do, but I know for one thing, they're going to be investigating Hillary's emails. <laughs> now, I, I, I mean, I really think we've had a guy who really didn't appreciate the separation of powers. And we saw that in a lot of the ways that he, that he, that he governed. And uh, it's pretty been pretty interesting to watch that. So, um, and, and of course, the irony is that the guy who apparently didn't know a whole lot about what judges did uh, ended up his longest lasting legacy will be the judges he put on the court. Uh, everything else he's done is probably going to get undone pretty quickly. Um, but um, these uh, younger judges are going to be there for quite a while. And um, it was a you know a very strong part of his strategy. Um, Getting to the question about uh, the, ch- it's the change in the membership of the court, as well as court packing type questions. Well, you know, we can spend a long time talking about whether Justice Breyer is going to give in to the pressure to uh, re- to resign so that a younger justice could come on. And you know, I don't think any of us would be surprised if he did decide to do that. In terms of court packing, um, I think that's a non-starter politically. Uh, it's fun to talk about all these different possible changes that can be made, but in order for um, in order for court packing to go anywhere in the Senate, uh, they need to have uh, they need to get past the filibuster. And there, there are two Republican senators who said they're, they're I mean Democrat senators who said they're going to keep vote to keep the filibuster. Uh, it takes sixty to override this fill uh, to to then get the the votes through. So. I think this is kind of a non-starter. I think it's fun to talk a little bit about it and see whether or not it would look, work politically. I think it would be a, a tough vote for a lot of um, a lot of Democrats in the Senate to uh, to vote in favor of uh, what appeared to be court packing, and and uh, so I'm I'm pretty skeptical that that can really go very far with that. Um, I do think the closest thing to, to, to packing that I would suggest again is going back to these circuit court judges, where there are states that there there are circuits that really should be by any kind of geographic consideration have more more judges, and I would be I would be pushing for those if I were the Democrats. Rocky, Deborah, Neil, what do you think? Do you think that President Biden's going to engage in court packing on the Supreme Court, or no? no I agree well, that court packing is a non-starter. But I think that there are broader programs 
uh, that can be utilized. Uh, and the president has, is appointing a commission to look at these. Uh, and I suspect that they will come back uh, with a report that uh, supports looking at uh, uh, a, the fix the court proposal, uh, which is a single standard 18 year term at the high court uh, that would restore the limits. Uh, each justice would be, uh, new justice would be added every other year under this program. And since there are nine justices, it turns out to be an 18 year term. Uh, and it means as you stagger them, uh, that every president gets to appoint two justices in his four year term or four justices uh, in an eight year term. Uh, that it seems to me uh, will solve many of the problems that we've experienced over the last four years uh, because we have been uh, saddled with some very intense uh, politicking rather than good judicial uh, work. And I think uh, we can look forward to something like that. The support is growing for it. Fix the court. If you, anybody who wants to go to fixthecourt.com, I think is the website and look at the proposal. It's now supported by scholars, by politicians. There actually was a law that was introduced in Congress last September, but unfortunately died at the close of the session. And I think you'll see some of that rising again uh, in the next year. Mm. You know, several of our audience members have posted really excellent questions uh, about age limits, term limits, etc. I will invite all of our audience members to please post questions uh, that we could ask the uh, panelists in the Q&A box. Uh, we will do our best to get through as many questions as you post as, as possible. So, Rocky, hey, Deborah, Marcus, Henry, yeah, and join. Just, yes, just one more on. point on this last Yes, one. please, please, please. I, I'd like to take a different reason or cite a different reason why we shouldn't, why I would be against stacking the court. Please. And that is, I think we've got to go back to um, having a, a, a respect for the independence of the Supreme Court, of the judiciary period. And as long as we start to say, well, we can fix it by stacking or uh, then I think society at large will not regain the respect that, that we need to have and, and confidence that we need to have in the independence of the judiciary. And we can only do that if we begin to, again, speak to and, and to the general public as lawyers, it is really our obligation to help walk them through and to understand why it's important, even when, in, when we disagree with a, a judge's decision, why it's important to have that judge there, to have that professional, to have that independence. And so the, the, the talk about stacking and uh, that for me, I, I think goes, moves away from the the idea of the independence of the judiciary and i and i would mm. don't want us to lose that i, I couldn't That's agree more with, with deborah um I, I, and you know it, it seems to me that when president obama got two appointments uh there wasn't a problem and nobody was arguing to pack the court or impose a uh, term limits now that there's uh six uh, republican appointed judges uh justices on the court now it's a problem and I think that over time, history has a way of evening things out. Um, in, in my view, if, if you adopt something like this 18-year uh, term limit so that every president gets two appointments, it really now does become political because it's seen as, oh, these, they're going to appoint two members to the court, and that's part of the administration. And so the goal should be, let's continue to concentrate on the qualifications and the integrity and the work ethic uh, of the justice uh, nominees 
And uh, yeah, the president is going to appoint people with whom he or she is ideologically aligned. That's a fact of life. Uh, but over time, these things tend to even out. My disagreement with you, Rocky, uh, is that this is not just a situation of a president appointing justices. In the last four years, we have experienced really intense partisan conflict. Uh, some say uh, that uh, the administration stole two seats from the Democrats. <laughs> so I think what we need to do is to find a way to remove judicial appointments, particularly the Supreme Court, uh, from the kind of partisan bickering uh, that we experienced uh, mm. in the Garland situation and in the Amy Coney Barrett situation, mm. uh, and look at ways in which the Supreme Court uh, can be restored uh, to uh, the reputation that it enjoyed before then. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I don't think you will ever get the bickering out of any political activity and the appointment and nomination and confirmation of a justice is in using a small p, a, a political activity. Um, I don't think we should pretend that it's otherwise. Well, Joel Minsker, one of our audience members asks, if we go to 18 year terms for the Supreme Court, how would that apply to existing justices? And Ar Armando Fernandez asks, doesn't a life term for judges aid in the justices independence? What do you all think about those comments and questions from our audience members? Well, the answer to Joel's first question uh, is that the, the, the plan that fixed the court as uh, has put forth is for future only. Uh, it does not affect those who are currently sitting on the court. Uh, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. It'll take a while before uh, that comes into effect. Uh, but I think that there are lots of reasons to be considerate uh, and to consider uh, those, uh, those programs. Mm-hmm. Henry Depper. I, I want to uh, think about that second question. Mm -hmm. uh, pick up on a point that, that Rocky mentioned, because it is true that judges tend to reflect the ideology of the, the, the justices of the presidents that appointed them. And if you look at the, the current point, Alito and Thomas were appointed by the first President Bush. Breyer was appointed by Clinton. Roberts was appointed by the second President Bush and Sotomayor appointed by Obama. And for, of course, we know Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Coney Barrett were appointed by President Trump. But my favorite to think about is Chief Justice Earl Warren. And when you just as a, just if you allow me a, a, a just a brief moment Please. here, he started out, he was a district attorney and then attorney general in California. And when he was the Attorney General of California, he was actually a proponent of the forced removal and internment of 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. This, is Justice, this was Justice Earl Warren. He ran for Vice President. He was a Republican Governor of California. He ran for Vice President. He ran for, he, he tried to get the presidential nomination uh, but that went to Dwight Eisenhower, who then appointed him as the chief justice. And he is the chief justice that wrote the majority opinions in some of the most uh, um, profound cases, Brown versus Board of Education, yeah. Miranda versus Arizona, and Loving versus Virginia. That's right. So there is nothing that we think about where he started and what kind of a chief justice he became that would indicate that he would he would evolve or 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 whatever word you want to use and i think that goes to the question because there is something about the security of a lifetime appointment there's something about the experience and other factors that move you and can move justices and i think anyone who strives and, 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 and becomes 
a member of that board. That is that is hallowed and sacred. Mm -hmm. And I think that they take it very seriously. And before they would allow themselves to be tools and used, there there is some there is for me uh, something very special about being that justice mm -hmm. and very freeing. So I do mm -hmm. think having the ability to then say, yes, I was appointed by this president, but this is where I stand, having looked at the law, because that's what we ask them to do. That's we right. ask them to look at the law and be fair and impartial in their judging. Uh, right. And so I always, when I, when I get down or when, when people, non-lawyers especially, come to me and they're like, oh my God, the court, I say, listen, and I always hold up Justice Earl Warren, Chief That's Justice right. Earl Warren, That's from right. where he started to where he ended. And to Such Deborah's point, to share um, you know, I, I guess to the consternation of us conservatives, uh, Republican appointed justices tend to get a little bit more liberal, some of them, uh, but I never see liberal <laughs> justices get more conservative. <laughs> so I don't know what happens up at the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, but uh, no, I think Deborah is absolutely right. They all do take the job. It's the, it's the air. I mean, we just had an example of it. Uh, a, a court dominated by uh, Republican appointed justices, three of them were appointed by President Trump, refused to take up his petitions challenging the that's election right. results. And so that's uh, right. if we need that's any more evidence example. that justices are independent and they're not beholden to the, um, the uh, president who appointed them, this is it. Yes. So, uh, yes, absolutely, Rocky. So we have about 12 minutes to go in this part of this event. So let us get to Rose Aviles's question, which is really the question of the hour of the month of the year. Are there any court cases we should be watching closer than others that will have huge implications on the citizens, government, and or international relations? So what are the hot courses, hot cases that are coming down the pike that we should have, a, have an eye on? You notice nobody's answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a big question. Well, I think that there are some cases that are uh, in the works now that are not yet before the Supreme Court that could turn out to be important. Uh, and there are many groups that are planning litigation with the sole purpose of getting it to the Supreme Court. So I think we may see some surprises, but I'm not sure that I could tick off uh, four or five cases that are likely to come before the court that are going to be really important. I'm, I'm in Neil's camp. I don't know uh, uh, which particular cases, but I think there are going to be a huge number of cases working their way through the system that are challenges to uh, executive orders and administrative decision making. Uh, the deference document, uh, the, the Chevron deference issues yep. going away. Um, uh, both um, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch are very interested in those issues. They're looking, they're waiting for the right case. And I think it's gonna be a very important one and um, overturn of precedent of a big case by Scalia uh, might happen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Deborah, Rocky? I, I think we'll see um, more First Amendment cases because of what I said about Justice Barrett. Yeah, and um, um, we've had quite a few already coming up. For example, the recent decision regarding California's ban on in-person worship services as a result of COVID, they overturned that saying it discriminated against religion. So uh, I think we'll see more of that. And I think given President Biden's statements yesterday regarding more gun control legislation coming out, we'll definitely see more second amendment cases over the next several years. Yeah. Tabra? Yeah, I, I would agree. I was thinking about the categories of cases. And at the beginning, I said what some might consider the controversial cases. And that, you know, there's gun rights, I think abortion rights, that I, I don't mm -hmm. think we're done with that. Uh, uh, how it will be teed up exactly, I, 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 I can't say. Uh, I do think there'll be some religious freedom cases. These are the ones where in the previously 
they may have felt that there weren't enough votes mm -hmm. on the conservative, libertarian, however, judicial restraint uh, uh, groups uh, of, the, of the court. Uh, but now they may have those votes. So I think you'll see uh, an uptick in those kinds mm -hmm. of cases, uh, even accepting them and then, uh, of course, hearing them. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Rose, that all of our panelists are, are absolutely right. The only, the only additional category of, of cases that I would add would be cases where liberty is in conflict with notions of equality. Um, Deborah touched upon this. I, I do think that in, in some of the LGBTQ rights cases that are making their way through the system, we will likely see within the next year, two, three, um, uh, a case reach the Supreme Court that will uh, better define, perhaps, uh, religious rights vis-a-vis um, -vis LGBTQ non-discrimination. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how this court addresses that kind of case. Um, if I may jump in. Yes, there is Rocky. one case in particular, and that is a, a challenge to the Affordable Care Act. That's right. Is, yes, is of on course. the docket, and that's, that's going to get that's a, a that's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. They just argued it, and it's not completely clear that uh, where where the conservative justices uh, are are going to vote on that. That's a that's a very big one. Henry, as an administrative law professor, I feel like I, I have to ask you what you think will be happening with Chevron deference before this particular court. Well, I think those, I'm, I'm not an administrative law guy, but I've watched this because of just interest in regulatory policy overall and also, you know, the antitrust issues that are going to be coming up. up. Um, I, Gorsuch and, and, um, uh, Kavanaugh clearly care a lot about these issues. Gorsuch has written a book about it. Um, the, um, but they're they're waiting for the right case. And, yeah. Um, you know, right now they're just kind of dancing around the margins a little bit and little changes here and there. Um, they they just I think really want to, you know, they don't want to just, you know, make a, a small tweak. I think they really want to change the way we think about the relationship, and that's. Um, that's huge um, if they could if they can find that case. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are there are lots of groups out there that are trying to you know present them with a case that would allow them to get get where they want to go. Um, mm -hmm. And for for those audience members not familiar with what it is that we mean by Chevron deference or what the Supreme Court and the the federal courts mean by Chevron deference, it really boils down to who it is that gets to make very important decisions on policy and law. Is it, is it Congress or can Congress delegate that power to federal agencies that are putatively expert in those areas? And when the agency speaks, how much deference should courts uh, you know, uh, afford give those agency decisions? And so Chevron deference generally has been very deferential, and the the question is whether that deference should um, stay in place. Uh, all right, so we have six minutes to go. Victoria Marti, another one of our audience members, asks this very good question. I couldn't agree more that the U.S. Supreme Court should be independent of party or ideological affiliations. What are some of the best solutions we can use for the long term to ensure that this is achieved, meaning that the court is not as political and as ideologically divided as it has been in recent years? Are, is there is there something that the court can do, or others can do, or the president or the or the Senate can can do to have the court be more unified? Everybody, <laughs> I'm afraid that as long as Supreme Court justices are nominated by presidents and confirmed right. by senates, uh, that's wishful thinking. Yes, uh, I'm hopeful that we can get to a point where we're more concerned with talent uh, and, uh, uh, and qualifications than we are with politics. Uh, and Rocky's comment about 
uh, President Trump's appointment, I think, is, uh, is, is an example of that. I hope we have more of it. Henry Zephyr-Rocky? Uh, yeah, I thought, uh, you know, a bad turn in all, in all of this relationship was um, President Obama's comments about Citizens United in the State of the Union address, which was a straight in the face uh, confrontation with the Supreme Court in a, in a situation where he's up there looking down on them. Uh, I think that that was, um, that, that was a very problematic thing to do. It made the Supreme Court seem more political than I actually, than, than I actually believe it is. But that I'm a great admirer of President Obama, but if I were his speechwriter, that would not have appeared in his text. Yeah. Mm. Let's not forget that despite the different uh, philosophical approaches to the law of the justices, there are some really great friendships there. And the most famous one, of course, being the one between Justice Scalia and, and Justice Bader Ginsburg. And uh, they were opposite ideologically, but they were the best of chums. And so, you know, yeah. I think they're, they are united, uh, but they're, they're, they're friends, but they have very principled disagreements. And frankly, that's what we want. We don't want groupthink at the court. Mm -hmm. We want people who are strong intellectually, who are gonna stand up for what they believe, who are gonna listen to the other arguments, and then they're going to make the best decision that they can. Mm -hmm. Deborah, here. Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with that, and I think I think there are things that we can do uh, as, 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 as lawyers to help tone down the rhetoric um, and to, to really educate. Again, I go back to the public and maybe it's because I'm thinking about in my president-elect of, hat of the ABA, I wanna really focus on civics and civility. And, uh, and I think we've lost a lot of that the last uh, decade, really. Um, and, uh, and, and that's where we can come in and play a role. You know, I've, I've written a lot over the years uh, about the independence of the judiciary uh, and the obligation that lawyers have to fight for independence of the judiciary. And I think we need to keep that in mind as well and continue to fight for an independent judiciary. Mm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Any and final you know thoughts, everybody? Deborah, that, please. The best way to do that is when, is, is when we stand up for, for really unpopular decisions, We're, but we stand there and we, we indicate that, as, as Rocky has said, we, these are people that we are entrusting to listen to the law, to listen to the facts, to look at the facts, to listen and to make a decision. And whether we agree with the decision or not, we don't attack the individual judges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we can certainly disagree about whether or not we think the decision is correct, but it doesn't become personal. And we really have to, we, we, we have to be the ones that continue that message and say it over and over again. And so whether it's President Obama who's standing there as a lawyer, he's president, but he's also a lawyer, uh, that, you know, that's the kind of thing that we have to take the task. And we have to in, in make sure that we are indicating independence, independence of the judiciary and not attacking the judges Absolutely. personally. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it would be wonderful for when President Biden gets a nominee and nominee makes it going through the vetting process that the Republicans sit back and evaluate the merits of the person and don't engage in personal attacks. And if the person is qualified, vote for them. I'd like to see the vote mm -hmm. back up into the 90s. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's just that the, the, what's happened now has just become terrible. I, I think anyone who's courageous enough to take the nom to take on the nomination of being a Supreme Court judge is, judge is, is a, there's a fine line between courage and insanity. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> done that. Uh, and, uh, I have a prediction, and that is that um, if uh, President Biden gets uh, to make an appointment, because it's really not going to shift the balance of the court, unless there's a, a significant problem, um, that's not going to be as hotly contentious mm -hmm. as the Kavanaugh I hope you're right. uh, mm -hmm. or uh, Barrett appointments. Well, Rocky, Rocky has the I last say, word. We, we have to mouth close. To God's ears. Yes. <laughs> so Deborah, Henry, Neil, uh, Rocky, I am the luckiest law school dean in the country to be able to have the honor of moderating this important conversation. And we as a university are very fortunate to have Deborah Enix Ross as one of our distinguished alums who will be serving as the head of the legal profession very, very soon. This is this is something that we take tremendous pride in. And and Deborah, we we give you a virtual round of applause for what is certainly to be very good news to come. Um, that concludes our panel, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, in our discussion today on the future of the Supreme Court, it is now my pleasure to turn the program back over to my colleague and friend and another distinguished alum, Devang Desai. Thank you very much. Dean Verona, um, we seem to be having some technical difficulties um, with the camera, but uh, there we go. Thank you. And uh, thank you again, Dean Verona, for uh, moderating a wonderful panel. And more importantly, thank you to each and every one of our panelists uh, for their tremendous insight and, might I add, congeniality on a very sensitive, hot topic. Um, and so at this point, um, Allow me to uh, reintroduce uh, the uh, Distinguished Alumni Lecture Series and, and how we are so fortunate uh, through the generosity of Stu and Ambassador Block who had the foresight to endow this lecture series because of the strong commitment that they felt uh, that education deserves and one that allows for a program like this to live on in perpetuity to highlight the incredible depth and breadth of our University of Miami alumni as we've seen this evening. And so what I'd like for us to do is um, one, recognize each and every one of our panelists. And I think all of our participants will agree that Henry, our ABA president-elect Deborah, Rocky and Neil certainly do uphold our alma mater's values uh, in their lifetime of service, not only professionally, but also in our respective communities. And for that, that's why we are gathered also this evening to present each of them with their Distinguished Alumni Award for 2021. And their names will be inscribed in our roles as Distinguished Alumni for the University of Miami. And so congratulations to each and every one of you uh, for all that you continue to do. And at this time, I'd like for you to, if you could, display your award so that all of the members joining us tonight can see it. Oh. If you haven't. I haven't gotten mine yet. Ah, yeah. well, we'll take care of that. But I yeah, know- Yeah, and the ice storm took mine from me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Henry. But we are doing the U. But we are doing <laughs> the U, absolutely. All about the U. <laughs> absolutely. Thank and you, so, Stu and Julia. With that, allow me to please uh, introduce our benefactors, uh, Stu Block and Ambassador Julia Chang Block, to say a few words. I wanted to thank uh, Dean Verona for taking the time and the commitment to put together this panel and to moderate this panel. I want to thank the staff of the alumni uh, alumni section of the University of Miami, particularly Maria, who brought us, I think, a record audience. And I want to thank all the participants for just proving my point, uh, this vision that Julie and I had, that there were so many wonderful, distinguished alumni from the University of Miami that nobody has known about, that sh they should know about, and all of you and your participation have just proven our point. Congratulations, and thank you for accepting this award. 
And all I have to say is that I support my husband's dedication to the University of Miami. Thank you, Ambassador and Stu. We really appreciate it. You got it, Stu. <laughs> there you go, man. <laughs> and to uh, each and every one I never of knew my right from my left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. And to each and every one of our participants this evening, I do hope that you enjoyed our Distinguished Alumni Lecture Series presentation. And we want to once again say thank you for your continued commitment to our university in events such as this, which help promote and foster the institution's ability to continually provide lifelong engagement and educational opportunities for everyone. And so as all of us have heard so eloquently this evening, remember, it is extremely vital for each of us to continue to be the soldiers for justice and for those of us who are in the legal profession to remember our oath to be the generals for freedom. And later this week, I know that each of you will receive an email from our Alumni Association asking for your feedback on how we can better programs like this and better serve our alumni. Please take a moment and fill it out and send it back to us. We'd love to hear from you. Again, remember, it's always great to be a Miami Hurricane. Go Canes. Go Canes. Go Canes. Go Canes. <laughs> Thank you.